we interrupt our regularly scheduled programming with an urgent request that every person watching this channel immediately open your Bible and get ready to understand it. Welcome to The Way, The Truth, and The Life, a program designed to help you better understand your Bible. And now, here is your host, Ken Wade. Hello, friends. I'm Ken Wade. Welcome to The Way, The Truth, and The Life television broadcast. The Way, The Truth, and The Life is personified in Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, and we invite you to learn of Him and the wonderful Word of God. Go get your Bible, bring it out, read along with us. We are in the 21st chapter of the very last book of the Bible, Revelation, and we've been on a wonderful journey through every verse of the book of Revelation. And today, we're going to pick up with Revelation, the 21st chapter, and the 9th verse. So get your Bible and may God bless the word spoken. Verse 9 says, There came unto me, by the way, this is John the Revelator, the Apostle John speaking, There came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues. So John is saying, someone in the vision, an angel who had carried one of the seven vials or bowls that were poured out as plagues, one of these seven uh, personified uh, priests of the vision back in Revelation 16, comes to him now and he says to me, Come up hither, or come hither. I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, this is very interesting because it's an invitation to John to come hither to where the angel is rather than the angel just lopping it in his lap or putting it in his brain. He wants John to do a little action, and by saying, come hither, that would indicate those who manifest some interest, the John class, particularly the last members of the church, dear friends. When the book of Revelation is exposed and, and uh, uh, revealed, the book of Revelation has been a closed book pretty much down through the gospel age, even though people got a blessing out of it. It's just recently that there's been a real interest in it and a defining of what the symbols are. So we feel that the John class are like the feet of Christ, the end time church members, the very end of the end time. So we're kind of like the John class and he is told by the angel, this, I believe it's the seventh plague, come here. Uh, the seventh uh, angel personifying a uh, priestly class uh, that carries the bowl that poured it out earlier in the 16th chapter. And John is invited. Uh, and if you're interested, dear friends, in prophetic matters, if you're interested, not just out of curiosity, but in the will of God, to know what God is doing in planet Earth, then this class of John could include you and me, because we have spiritual interests in this wonderful Word of God, the book of Revelation. And, uh, and this takes a little time and effort to study. Uh, to go in the direction of God requires uh, patience, study, defining of words and dictionaries, and what a reward it reaps. Dear friends, I cannot tell you in words what a blessing I've received by going through the book of Revelation. Uh, it's just been such a blessing for me because I study probably four to five hours before every study we have at class on Revelation. And this is like my fourth or fifth time. So the more you study, the more it all falls together like a puzzle or the pieces come together. So don't try to get it all in one sitting or one day. Don't say it's too much for me. Be patient if you're a Christian. God says, uh, my word, word shall not return unto me void. This is God's word. And every word is out of the mouth of God. So revelation is as important as the Psalms or Genesis or any other part of the New Testament. It's all equal. The word of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So be patient, pray for the Holy Spirit in your private studies, 
and pray over the word before you study and it'll come to life. So here John is approached by one of the seven angels, verse 9 of chapter 21. That had, and this is one of the angels that had the seven bowls or vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come here, come hither, come hither. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Now John is going to have an, a wonderful vision of the bride of Christ, the new government of Christ, if you will, personified in a city. A city in the Bible is usually representative of a government. Who is the new government of the new world order or the new heavens and the new earth? It's Jesus Christ and His bride. They're going to reign. Know ye not the saints? She'll judge the world. We shall reign with Jesus. If we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. Reigning means that they're subjects. You don't have kings and queens reign over nothing. I never could understand the Seventh-day Adventist view of, of uh, the earth being burned up and made of ashes and the Satan will be down here, they said, for a millennium, for, for a thousand years. Why would Christ want to reign over uh, ash-covered earth? He's not going to, dear friends. He's going to fix up this earth and make it a paradise. And who's He going to reign over? All the world, the dead, small and great, are going to stand through Him before God. Jesus is the mediator between God and men. Verse 10. So this seventh, this seventh uh, plague angel, which I believe it was, carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. So John's like transported or translated, um, raptured to this big mountain. And he sees that great city. Now, not the fault city, not the city of Babylon the great, the, the counterfeit kingdom, but he sees that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. This is the spiritual Jerusalem having the glory of God and her light. Remember he said, I'm going to show you the bride. This is in symbol, the glory of the church after the wedding. Having the glory of God. We know not what we shall be, but we know that when Christ shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall share and be joint heirs in his glory. Having the glory of God, this city. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like the jasper stone, clear as crystal. This is the diamond, dear friends. This is the clear, white, bright, glistening. One verse talks about glistening as glistering. It's just emanating the light, the whole city. The bride. It's a symbol for the bride. The new city, the new government. And this city had a wall around it in this vision. Now all this seems very small in our brains till we learn something. This city is 12,000 furlongs high. What's a furlong? 1,500 miles high. 1,500 miles long and wide. Well, if you've got 1,500, 1,500, and 1,500, what does that make it? It makes it a cube in the vision. We're not saying the Bride of Christ is literally a cube, 1,500 miles squared, or a cube. No. This is the vision illustrating the glory of the new government that comes down. Now picture, in your mind's eye, if you were looking at a 1,500 mile uh, high and wide square cube in the sky, if it was a long way away, it would be small, way out in the universe. As it came closer and closer and closer, it would become bigger and bigger and bigger. Just like my hand, the closer it gets to the camera, the bigger it gets. So you've got a 1,500 mile cube above the earth now. Why? That would cover everything you could see. Get beginning to get the feeling of greatness and largeness and the size of this government. It's going to envelop the globe, as it were. But it's like a jasper stone at a distance, like a diamond in the sky, 
like crystal, clear as crystal. And it says in verse 12, it has a wall, great and high, and around the wall, there are 12 gates into this city, which is in the shape of a cube. And at the gates, 12 angels. So there's three gates on each side of the city. It has a wall around it. The names are written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Over the gate is the name of a tribe of Israel. And there were 12 tribes. What does this remind you of? Remind you of Revelation, the seventh chapter, and Revelation, the 14th chapter. There are 12,000. It reminds us there are 12,000 in each tribe that are of spiritual Israel. And these names are written over each gate. There were 12 apostles also. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 sons of Jacob made the 12 tribes of Israel. Then you had 12 apostles chosen by Jesus. 12 is throughout the entire Bible, Old and New Testament. So here you have three gates on each side of this cubical city. On the east three gates, excuse me, verse 12 says the 12 tribes of the Israel names are written over each gate, one over each gate. Then you have on the east, verse 13, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. On the west, three gates. On the wall of the city, um, and, excuse me, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So in other words, the foundation, there's three stones on each side. Different kinds of foundation stones. Each one represents one of the 12 apostles. Because they are on top of Jesus as the foundation. They're the next in line to Jesus. Jesus cho chose the 12 to make them foundations in his church. Jesus is the main foundation. He is the rock upon which the church is built. Not Peter, I might add. All 12 are in the city, not just Peter. So it says that in verse 17, he measures the wall. John does. Or the angel, I'm not sure which, I'd have to ch double check that. But anyway, oh, excuse me, I jumped down too quick. It will tell us. He that talked to me, verse 15, had a golden reed. He does the measuring to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lies four square. It's a cube. Verse 16. And the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. That's 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles length, which makes it a square cube. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, the wall that goes around the city. Isn't that an interesting number? You have 144 a number of times in the Bible. That represents the number 12 squared, which represents the new Jerusalem, the bride, the 144,000. Now, there are many other Christians in heaven that will be in this city, but they're not in the wall. They are the great multitude of Christians. You have wise and you have foolish virgins in a parable, and they're all virgins. And you have, uh, in the tabernacle, you have the, the bullock and the goat, Bullock is Jesus, the goat is the church, uh, the 144,000, but the scapegoat are the foolish virgins, the great multitude of Christians. I like to call the great multitude mentioned in Revelation 7 uh, and 14, the 14th chapter and the 7th chapter, the great multitude of Christians are what we call compromising Christians. They're those people who do love the Lord, they have the Holy Spirit, they're born again, spirit begotten, spirit filled, however you refer to it, but they are truly Christians, but there are a great number, a great multitude of Christians who are Sunday go meeting only and they, let, they have low oil level. You know, when you run your car on low, low oil and you let that light stay on, it'll burn up your engine and your car will eventually stop. These Christians are close to empty on oil. That's why we're studying the Bible, to learn God's will and be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is the olive oil in the lamps of the tabernacle. And these lamps need to be kept filled. And the foolish virgin said, give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. And the wise virgin said, we haven't got time. I'm sorry, you'll have to go to where you buy the oil. And so before it's too late, dear friends, and the tribulation's here, now's the time to fill your vessel with the Holy Spirit. Be ye filled with the Spirit, the Bible says. And we have that privilege now. And this helps fill us with the 
the, uh, uh, the oil, the Holy Spirit. Now, I just figured out that 12,000 furlongs is 7,920,000 feet high. 7,920,000 feet high, just if you want an idea of how big this vision was when John saw it come down hovering over the earth. This isn't a little tiny city. This covers everything John could see, and it's hovering over the earth, representing complete control of the Christ head and body over planet earth when the kingdom is set up. That's the kingdom we pray for. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. And all this is being given to us in symbolic form to motivate us to know the power of God's future. There's a wonderful future for the world. God is going to set this wonderful government up in earth. It's a powerhouse. He's going to get rid of Satan and the demons and sin and sickness and death and crying and pain. And we went through that last time. Now, what's interesting is picture a 1,500 mile, 1,500 mile high city in your mind, if you can. Just picture you were on the ground looking at it. You couldn't see the end of the top, could you? You couldn't see the end of the sides. Say you're on a corner of this. But then it says, there's this little wall around it, which is 144 cubits. You know how, how high 144 cubits is? Only 216 feet. Now picture 216 feet next to 1,500 miles. It would be like a pinhead next to the Empire State Building. Yes, dear friends, this is an awesome vision. It's showing us the glory of the city. The building of the wall, in verse 18 of it, was like jasper also. And the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. So you have like a, a, a gold atmosphere and glow, but you can see through the walls. Interesting, huh? And then it even explains the, the stones in verse 19. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Picture the glorious jewels in this. And there's a scripture that says, Gather my saints together unto me and gather my jewels. You know, Jesus, Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. You know why? He's going to gather his jewels for this city. He's going to steal his jewels away and take them home, rapture them to the glory of the wedding and the reign of Christ. And here is some of the glory. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, or sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth is, you know my Bible's torn here, and I should know this by heart, but... I'll have to go back to that. It's P-R-A-S-U-S. -S. Anyway, I can't pronounce the first part. The 11th is adjacent, the 12th an amethyst. I had my Bible rebound and they put tape over some of the broken pages and some of this tape you can't see through, so it makes it a little difficult, but I love my old Bible. So there's 12 stones. Each one represents, dear friends, one of the apostles. Each one is one of God's precious jewels in the foundation on Christ. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Now, this is pretty. You've got tw three pearls, great big pearls, with a tunnel through them, making the door to the city. Three on each side. Why a pearl? Remember that parable? It's a short parable where Christ said there was a man that gave everything he had for the pearl of great price. So everyone entering this city will see a name over the gate and realize that the plan of God is Israelitish. It started with the covenant promise to Abraham, and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So people will all have to become Israelites by faith, as the churches are Israelites by faith now. We are spiritual Jews. It says so. The 144,000 are spiritual Israelites. We're not literal Jews in all cases. Some Jews did accept Christ, mostly Jews in the early church. But what makes you a true Jew in the New Testament is the belief in all the promises of God and accepting Christ as your Messiah. Then you're a true spiritual Jew and uh, a completed Jew, it's called in some cases. So the name over the gate, the pearl of great price, 
It cost Jesus everything he had to purchase that gate to get in that city. He gave it all to purchase his bride. And it's because of Jesus and the bride that there's a city. Because this is like a bride adorned for her husband. This is the new government, friends. The glory of it. And God has designed all these wonderful gems in, uh, what do they call it? Gemology. Think of it. With his church and Jesus Christ in mind, he's pl planned the flowers of earth with pictures in mind. The insects of earth but gems and rocks all have a meaning, dear friends. And every one of these stones, just as the 12 stones in the priest's breastplate represented one for each tribe, 12 of them, each one symbolic of a meaning of the type of individual that's called to that tribe. It's a wonderful study. We don't have time to go into it now. But 12 is a scriptural prophetic number. Verse 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every se several gate was of one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple in this city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of this new Jerusalem. I've had brethren and believers tell me, see, there's not going to be a third temple. No temple in this city. Dear friends, this is talking about the spiritual government. There's no literal third temple in heaven. There's God's temple in heaven, but this is the new city. There's no temple in that. That's a spiritual government, the bride. The literal temple is down here. You say, how do you know that? Because, dear friends, the book of Ezekiel has nine chapters on the temple that hasn't been built yet. That's a literal temple. This is a spiritual, symbolic temple. And later it says there's no, no sun or moon either. Well, you're going to tell me there's not going to be a sun on earth in the kingdom of Christ? No, this is talking about the spiritual government. There won't be a need of sunlight because Christ, the Lamb, and God are the sun of it, the light of it. And there won't need to be a temple because Christ and God are the covering of the glory of it. So verse 22 says, I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon. This isn't the literal city of Jerusalem. This is the spiritual government that will not only rule over the literal Jerusalem, but the whole planet Earth. It didn't have need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did enlighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And notice verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved, all the world is going to have a chance to be saved in the kingdom. The world certainly isn't saved now. Nations aren't saved now. They shall walk in the light of it. Praise the Lord. Everyone's going to bow the knee to Christ and God, to the glory of God. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. The kings in that day will be the ancient prophets and worthies who are raised from the dead in the better resurrection, spoken of in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into the city. That's all the prophets Probably 144,000 of those prophets in the Old Testament, one for every saint that made their calling and election sure in the New Testament. That's just my guess. It's a thought. But there'll be thousands of prophets, both male and female. Ruth will be there. Sarah will be there. Oh, yes, lots of females were, were uh, ancient worthies. Maybe not all prophets, but they were ancient worthy, worthies. Uh, one of the prophetesses is Huldah. There's a gate in Jerusalem uh, in the Bible called Huldah's Gate. She was a prophetess. Oh yes, dear friends, the kings of the earth are coming into this kingdom and the nations that are saved shall walk in it, in the light of it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. Isn't that wonderful? It'll be open for everyone. For there shall be no night there. No sin, sickness, and evil, and death, dear friends. For death and sin will be wiped away, all tears and dying. And they shall bring their glory into it, verse 26, and the honor of the nations into it. In other words, everything must conform to the bride and the Messiah. And it will be blessed if people conform, but you're going to have to go through the gates to get into that city. And there shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh, worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life 
are going to dwell in that new world government. Dear friends, it makes you want to be a part of it, doesn't it? And even now, there's peace of God in our hearts when we have the Lord Jesus. Let me send you The Divine Plan of the Ages, if I could. The Divine Plan of the Ages is a book that goes through every subject of the Old and New Testament, every biblical subject. The creation of man, the difference between evolution and uh, uh, creation, uh, the two don't harmonize. The Bible doesn't teach evolution. The epics and dispensations we've talked about, the, the new age, the new world and heavens, the old earth and heavens. What are they? You've got three dispensations to learn about. You've got all kinds of scriptures in those dispensations. This even has a chart on page 54, anyway, uh, giving you the entire plan in, in a wonderful map, wonderful chart of the ages, showing you the millennial age, the gospel age, the patriarchal age, the Jewish age, the age of the tabernacle, right in for the free book today. It's an entire book in paperback edition. Write me Ken Wade, P.O. Box 2692, Southfield, Michigan 48037. Oh, friends, you won't be sorry. The Divine Plan of the Ages is, I believe, a work that will help our salvation in understanding the Word of God. It may be plague one for people that don't like the truth, but this is a work of salvation for those who want to make their calling and election sure. Every subject of the Bible made easy. The Judgment Day, the fall of man, the resurrection, Christ's second coming, it's all in the divine plan of the ages. So write us this week. And that's P.O. Box 2692. Write it down. Southfield, Michigan, 48037. Dear friends, we'd like to remind you that the purpose of the broadcast is to draw us closer to our Heavenly Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus personally in your life daily, if you don't have Him on the throne of your heart reigning, in your life, guiding and directing your every move. If you don't start your day every day with Jesus, if you don't have prayer with God through the Son, you're missing the greatest blessing anyone could ever have. Accept Jesus Christ and you'll be happy for eternity. May God bless you. Thank you. You have been watching The Way, The Truth, and The Life with Ken Wade. If you have enjoyed today's broadcast, please let us know by writing Ken Wade, Post Office Box 2692, Southfield, Michigan, 48037. This program has been brought to you by Christian Bible Students and is supported wholly by voluntary contributions. Our address again is Ken Wade, Post Office Box 2692, Southfield, Michigan, 48037.